Hi, welcome to Thing I Love. I'm the Marvelous Patrick. This week, I'm really excited to have with me Carla Ulbrich. Carla is a musician uh, who I discovered listening to Pandora way back when. Uh, she's kind of got fed into the algorithm for me, and I really liked her music. And so then I liked her Facebook page, as was the fashion of the time. And there was some comments and chatting and eventually Facebook friendship. And here we are. And I've never actually met her uh, in real life person or anything like this until now with the pseudo Zoom meeting uh, way to do it. But uh, Carla came on and she talked about her love of SpongeBob. No, most important to point out, it's SpongeBob SquarePants, not as an intern I once had when I said, hey, do you ever watch SpongeBob? To me, SquarePants? As if there was, in fact, another SpongeBob one could uh, be a fan of. So uh, please uh, enjoy this episode of Carla Ulbrich um, as we talk about SpongeBob SquarePants, as well as her brand new album, The Loud Album, which is available streaming now. Links of everything we talk about, of course, down below. Enjoy! I've always, I've enjoyed your music for a while, so. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's just kind of, now you and I have never actually met in person. That's the, like, we're just like internet friends because um, I discovered you on Pandora. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah, I can't remember what the prompt was, but I think you came in like with, it started playing your music when I, 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 I think I started like with Weird Al and They Might Be Giants and maybe... And then it gave me Garfunkel and Oates and a few others. And then I hit like, and it eventually popped up your stuff. And I just like, yes, yes, yes. Um, and then I think I kind of like, I slid into your DMs accidentally or something. I don't know. Cause like I went and found you on Facebook and I liked your Facebook page. And I think somehow there was a friend request involved or something. I don't know, but some, here we are all these, all this time later. And we've been Facebook the plus friends. plus side for, of the internet. Yeah. This is the one time it wasn't like weird or creepy. <laughs> <laughs> Yet. <laughs> we got it. We got it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Well, we'll see how this conversation goes, I guess. <laughs> well, you know, I, I wasn't implying you. I meant me, you know. Oh, yeah. I, I assumed you did. Act. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so that's. Um, but you Are you wearing like pants? Couple... What? Oh. Are you wearing pants? Yes. Yes, I am. I, oh, OK. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, so thank you so much for coming on. And um, today you're gonna, you you said you'd uh, share the love of uh, the thing you love is SpongeBob, which I am a huge fan of as well. So I'm really excited to talk about SpongeBob. So uh, why do you love SpongeBob? There we go. Let's just go there. How could anybody not love SpongeBob? I guess it's the question. I mean, he is the happiest character I've ever seen. And I do understand really how people could not love him because if you're just half listening and you just hear it in the background, it's annoying. But if you pay attention, it's the funniest, sweetest thing. I just, I just love SpongeBob. My a niece, I think, is where I first encountered SpongeBob, and she would be over. I was staying in my parents' house for a couple years. Uh, gosh, this would have been 2000. 2000 something like that 2001 that and about right was, about when it hit yeah yeah my niece was about five years old and she would get so excited when the theme song came on it to go i can't hear you and she'd be screaming at the top of her lungs screech, bass, screech, bass! <laughs> jumping up and down on the couch and uh i was at the first couple episodes were like this is just because the, the weights isn't really, you know, but if you tune in and you listen, it's smart, it's funny, it's sweet, and it's just really well done. The characters are so fantastic. And um, then 2003, this is when I really got into SpongeBob. I was staying at my friend Grandpa Choco's house, and uh, he, he was at the time doing a, a comedy act, called himself Throwing Toasters, and he had a band, but the band never showed up to any of the gigs. So he was a solo act named Throwing Toasters. Uh, but now he works with the Jim Henson Company. He's a puppeteer. He's always been a puppeteer, but now that's his main thing. And uh, he was doing puppetry then as well. But I was staying at his house because I was in Los Angeles for about 10 days working on my third album. And recording is like super stressful especially when you're like away from home and you're doing like these 10 or 12 hour days and, and you're listening to yourself on playback and 
it, it's just so hard to hear all the mistakes or anything that you think you're basically just like nitpicking at yourself all day long. So it was, uh, needed something to de-stress. And I asked Grant if he had something funny I could watch. And he brought out the SpongeBob. I was like, oh yeah, SpongeBob, definitely. Because by then I was converted. And he had the early episodes where there weren't, there wasn't even any words. It was just captions and it sounded very French. I don't know, these might might not have ever made it onto the air. But I have never heard of those. That must yeah. have that was like like his college uh, work or something, maybe. Yeah, it was probably their, you know, not even pilot episodes, their experimental episodes. And I, I don't know if you know this, but Steven Hillenberg was a um, marine biologist and also uh, minored in art. So SpongeBob is just the culmination of his two loves and um, he was teaching marine biology. And I, I think it's so preposterous because you look at the way that things are uh, portrayed, obviously like, how could you drive a boat underwater? Boats <laughs> float. How could you build a fire underwater? But somehow it's just so adorable and endearing that you just are willing to suspend all disbelief. And even when it, and when you realize, okay, that's ludicrous, that can never happen, it just adds to the charm. I love the fact like they have water underwater. Yes. Like they go <laughs> swimming in, like it's, it's like blue yeah, they have a beach. water. They have a yeah. beach. Underwater and underwater beach <laughs> with the waves washing up on the shore underwater. underwater. Classic cartoon kind of stuff though, right? Like where it makes sense in the world it's in, but don't think about it too hard. Right. And that is just where I needed to be when I was when I was coming up from long hours of stressful recording sessions. It and you know, some personality conflicts in the studio always happens at some point and spending money like crazy paying all these session players and and i just like in the evening i just like i need and i need to just turn off my brain and spongebob i would watch just i would fall asleep watching it because he had dvds that would just play one episode after another after another and just laugh and laugh and fall asleep and i did that the whole time i was there it was so great and spongebob will always hold a special place in my heart for because of that it was such a, a great stress relief and and um and and it would anyway because it's just fantastic i think it's something magical that they put together with the voice casting that they have the voices are so perfect the characters are so well written the stories are so fantastic and i read that uh, a lot of the best stories this this you can always almost tell the stories that come from someone one of the writers or cast members life experience and apparently you know have you seen the episode sailor mouth yeah the sailor mouth is is a must see and even for like anyone who is like never seen any spongebob this is the perfect one to start with because i think it's so funny it's not a typical one but it's where SpongeBob and Patrick learn swear words and they saw them on a dumpster. Somebody had done gra graffiti on the dumpster outside the Krusty Krab. Yes, and, I remember this one now. Yes. yes. And and he had, they were just, every time they said a swear word, it would be a little dolphin sound. <laughs> yeah. They would bleep it out. Oh, that episode is so funny. So if you like want to just start watching SpongeBob and try, you know, like be like, I don't know, I don't like this Sailor Mouth. That's the episode that you got to you got to start with. If you don't like that one, then, then you're just not going to like SpongeBob because I think it's just so funny. And I know I just know the way they were they were when I listened to it. I'm like, I bet you they were swearing the cast. Oh, they must have been in the booth. They must have been. I mean, they must yeah, have, they had right. To be. I mean, because they're like, oh, I can do whatever I want here, you know. Exactly and, for once. <laughs> well, I think this is one of the things that is really why SpongeBob has stood the test of time and has kind of moved into that classic cartoon area that it now occupies. Um, because, like I said, you know, like uh, it's it's becoming generational. It's been on forever. You know, it, it you know, it's it's the last time I think there was a children's cartoon that ran this long was probably Rugrats. Um, you know, not, I mean, we, you know, the Simpsons, obviously the, you know, the long, the Holy Grail of, um, long Right, but it cartoons. wasn't really a kid's show. 
Not no, not really. But not the Rugrats before it was probably the, now SpongeBob, but I, it has that universality to it, right? Where SpongeBob he makes a good stand in for kids, especially like when he's at Mrs. Puff's school or doing all sorts of different things. But he also is going to stand in for grownups having to kind of go through that work a day when he's working at the Krusty Krab. And there's, he's very, you know, that mercurial uh, quality to, to the main character that really helps. I just love how enthusiastic he is about this terrible job that he had. I'm ready. Oh, boy. I'm going to work. Woo-hoo. I just wish I could feel that way all the time. It's such an admirable attitude. Uh, and that's what makes I- it. Just so he's so joyful. Yeah, and that's and I think that's the other thing that makes it like really a, a great show is, is the the characters all are very archetypal. Yes, you, you know in the main in the main character, you know you have SpongeBob, he's the archetype of a very positive person, right? And Patrick is the archetype of dumb, and which you know I, it's okay, whatever. You know all the people, oh Patrick, you know always to me, but that's okay. But um. Squidward is our is the archetype of negative or pessimist. Yes. Yeah, or sad sack character. And then you have Mr. Krabs, you know, he's greedy and Plankton who's evil and you start getting some of the tertiary characters. But I think that's what is so fun. Is it's it's fun to see someone who's always upbeat and positive come come into, you know, how they interact with those other kind of people. You know, Sandy is obviously the smart one. Right. You know. And and the, and how it, how they always see how that happened, you know, that, that connection. So then, and then you start mixing the characters where, you know, uh, when SpongeBob's around Patrick, he's the smart one to Patrick. But when he's around Sandy, he's the dumb one to Sandy. You know, yeah. when he's with Patrick, he's more grown up. But when he's with Mr. Krabs or Squidward, he's, he's more childish. So it's, and it's fun to see that, that kind of that spectrum because really the character doesn't change. Patrick was quite easily the dumb one. And there's character, there's comedy to be drawn from each one. There's something really funny about someone who's just always dumb, like Joey or Patrick. And uh, one, of, one of the things I liked about Patrick being the dumb one is that he's a starfish. And there's a scientific fact, and I remember this from Animaniacs, another great show. And I looked it up, and this is true starfish have no brains. Right? Oh, because of the well, way you know, Stephen would have known that. Stephen Hill and right, Brandon so that. So it's a layered joke. Like Patrick is the dumb one because starfish have no brains. <laughs> Marine biologists totally would have done that, though. Yeah, they totally would have known that. A couple yeah, like other they- episodes that I wanted to make sure I, I definitely mentioned for people who are uh, somehow missed out on SpongeBob because they were busy raising kids or who knows. Well, raising kids. fun. They they were too. They were the cool kids back in college or whatever. Maybe that was a shame right. for them. Yeah, you know what? I had I have periods in my life where I didn't watch TV for like three or four years because I was, you know, in, in school or in music school or whatever. Um, one that I really like is called Squidville. And that's where Squidward ends up moving to a community where it's just all squids and everybody's just like him. But that episode is not funny unless you first seen the context of some other episodes of the relationship between Squidward and his neighbors, Patrick and SpongeBob, and how how much they annoy him. Right? You can't really appreciate Squidville until you until you've seen some episodes where they're really getting on his nerves and, and they gotta get away from him. Oh, the leaf blower episode is also really funny. Oh, it's called a reef blower, but I'm not sure what what that episode is called. Uh, So if you want to prime yourself for Squidville, which I just thought was hysterical, uh, I would watch Band Geeks. And uh, that shows you about, you know, Squidward's ego and how much he loves music and how clueless he is about his very, uh, what what would you say, minimal talent? (laughs) Minimal talent. With his clarinet, with his sweet lady oh, clarinet. So, um, idiot box is a great, great one to start with to get an idea of the dynamic between Squidward and it's where idiot box is where um, Patrick and SpongeBob are playing with a cardboard box and using their imagination. What? <laughs> <laughs> That's my drum kit for when I tell dumb jokes and then I go. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta have that on hand. <laughs> <laughs> I love the idiot box episode. I see, I don't know that 
Okay, so I'm not the fan level. Uh, you are right. I know the titles. It's like that for me. That'd be like The Simpsons. I would know the titles of the episodes. But when, when you start, I'm like, oh, that's the one where they're in the. And yeah, I still to this day will go imagination yeah. whenever I say that word. My niece used to do that. That yeah, I didn't until I saw the episode. I was like, why does she? What? <laughs> I thought she'd be dramatic. The box, when yeah. the movie came out, uh, the first movie, and I, I think. Um, I had it was my first year out of college, and me and my college friends we all went to see it opening night. And now we, I, I went to art school, and um, and like I, I majored in comics, and a lot of them majored like in illustration or animation and everything. You know, it's like for us, it's like yeah, we're gonna go watch this cartoon. But we're like the only people in the theater. Like the, there's like four or five of us who are like college age, and it just parents and children everywhere around us. And we're watching this movie and we're just laughing our heads off. I, I did that too. I went with my husband to the SpongeBob movie. Uh, and we were probably the only people there on date night. <laughs> and he's not the big SpongeBob fan that I am. He just, but you know, I, I, I go to his movies. He goes to my movies, you know. You got to compromise. We do. <laughs> You can go see the boring movies uh, with him, and he can go see the fun movies with you, right? <laughs> yes, that's so, how I look at it anyway. <laughs> um, one episode that always sticks out in my mind, and you're going to probably know the name of the the episode, is the one where Patrick and SpongeBob are parents and married, and they adopt a little clam. I don't think I've seen that one. Oh my gosh, you're kidding me! I gotta see that. I haven't seen every episode. See, this is like, and this is a really famous episode. It turns out I don't know the name of it. Uh, maybe in editing, I'll be like flashing it across the screen right now, so I can like correct myself later. But this, this is up. This episode was like one of the first ones to get like negative media attention. People were complaining because Patrick and SpongeBob were at where they were like raising this adopted clam, and they were acting like they were married. And SpongeBob was staying at home taking care of the baby, and Patrick was going to work, and. And he'd always be like, well, I gotta go to work. And he'd go off to work. And it turns out work is him just going back to his house and watching TV the whole time. <laughs> I was going to say, I don't remember Patrick ever having a job. How about favorite characters then on, on SpongeBob? I mean, other than the, the eponymous SpongeBob himself. Uh, yes. He's got quite the cast in that show. Yeah, it is. It is quite a cast. And I shouldn't love him, but I love Plankton. How can you not love Plankton? And he's, he's, just, he's so sympathetic because he just keeps failing and he's got that nagging robot wife at home who just gives him such a hard time. And uh, my favorite line ever is when Plankton says, Oh, Karen, I'm this I'm happier than the day you agreed to be my robot wife. And she just goes, I never agreed to that. <laughs> the chum so bucket. brutal. Chum bucket. The chum bucket, yeah. Who's going to eat its chum bucket? Uh, so, yeah, characters, I, I think Plankton, obviously SpongeBob. Um, those are those are my top two. And, and then Patrick, because he's just so adorable. And Squidward is not someone who I'm fond of, but he's like, you love having him there. Right? He's, he's such a great contrast and a foil. And he makes, he just cracks me up. Uh, not because he's lovable, but just because he's not. <laughs> and and because he's such a contrast to SpongeBob and the whole tension between the two of them, of course, is, is sort of a one-sided tension. I, it feels like SpongeBob has this miraculous ability to not absorb any of the negativity and, and not even acknowledge it sometimes, it, like doesn't even register. You know? That's like, what I love, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's what's really great about their relationship to me is that it's very one-sided in terms of like SpongeBob adores Squidward. And, and it seems like at, at first glance, when you're just kind of doing that cursory first few episodes watch of it, that Squidward cannot stand Patrick and SpongeBob. But then you get into the episodes uh, like the one where Squidward moves to the gated squid community or anytime he's interacting like with, uh, with his name, I think is Squilliam, the, like the, the, the popular rich squid, you know, that you start to see that, that Squidward, despite himself, does value their relationship and, and, and actually does like SpongeBob. He can't really completely admit it somehow. He has to keep up this front 
that yeah. he's annoyed and he's better than them or whatever. But but he he that tentacle acres that's where he moved the Squidville episode is is a real like wow they they, they went ahead and made Squidward acknowledge that he really missed these guys when they weren't there and he moved yeah. back voluntarily. Spoiler well, and, that's, <laughs> and that's just what that's the other thing about Squidward too is right is despite all his like pro protesting that he's better than them or and uh, basically he always says he's like kind of acts like he's better than everyone he's working the same job as spongebob oh, that's <laughs> true. living in the same community as spongebob and you know i like you know and i think deep down like yeah you know, he also sees himself though as, I, like he always is trying to bring culture to spongebob which is one of my other favorite things about him like he believes he's like the voice of culture in that community and he's gonna he's gonna enrich their lives uh with his clarinet and other fancy things i think one of the craziest ones on there i'd love to hear what you think about him uh mr crab's owner of the crusty crab who you know is very greedy his daughter though the whale pearl <laughs> i know right how does a crab have a whale as a daughter yeah i don't i mean I, she's probably adopted but i i i think that's but I, again, I think, you know, like each of these characters has like that moment where like you think they're very one dimensional and then you get to see there's, there's another character that eventually they'll interact with where you see that other side of them that's almost like the opposite of how you think they are. And for Mr. Crab, I think that's his daughter, right? Because she's the one that can actually get him to spend money. Right. Any, yeah. Anything she asks for, she gets. Yeah. I mean, you know, he always says that he loves money, but Pearl is probably the one thing he loves more than money. Um. So there's been there's been two movies so far. There's a third one. I don't know when it's going to come out, but there's supposed to be a third one. What do you think of the movies? Um, I have to confess, I haven't seen the second movie. I saw the first one. You know what? Was, I'm not surprised, but I, I, I was like, I don't want to see it because all the trailers look terrible for it. They all looked like they were like this weird CGI live action thing. When it, and and it got me to not want to watch it. The the Sponge Out of Water movie. And then when my, my kids were like, okay, so we're watching it. And that's only like the last like 10, 15 minutes of it. The trailers are not at all what the movie is about. Trailers these days are very often, either they tell too much or they completely mislead you. You never know which one you're going to get. So yeah, I guess you can't judge a movie by its trailer. Books and covers. <laughs> So the, yeah, the, the, I, I love the the first the whole uh, in, integrating David Hasselhoff in the first movie. That was always another spoiler alert. But you know what? I think there's a statute of limitation on spoiler alerts. Yeah, I think I think we're in the clear now. But that's just it. There was a lot of really great guest stars in, in that first movie, right? Because you had Scarlett Johansson as Mindy and Jeffrey Tambor as uh, the King Poseidon or Neptune. Neptune, I think they called him in that one. It was well done. It was an adjustment to go from watching a 12 or 13 minute episode. It must have been a huge adjustment for them to go to a feature film length. Yeah, but it never dragged or anything either. Like it, it did, or, or sometimes like a lot of like kids things, they go and do a movie. It feels like it's just several episodes starting together. You can really feel like they, they did it in breaks so like they could air it on TV later. And that one didn't feel like it. It feels very cohesive. And it segues into the, another thing I really want to talk to you about is the music of SpongeBob. Now, you're a musician yourself. I'd love to hear what you think about all the, the different music they have on SpongeBob. Oh, I think they do a great job with the music. And it's not all, like, kid-oriented. I, I love the the Hawaiian sort of... And of course, the theme song is totally infectious. I, I think they do a great job with it. I've never been distracted by the music. I feel like it always enhances what they're doing. And uh, do, you, do you have a favorite song from the from the show or the movie or anything that you you know you'll find yourself kind of going the, back to? The fun song gets stuck in my head. <laughs> F is for friends who do things together. U is for you and me. There's also then the Broadway musical, weirdly enough, of SpongeBob. And I, I haven't seen it. I don't know. I don't know anyone who has. But um, like on the kids station, my kids listen to on XM, like they had a lot of the music come from that, uh, that they would play on the radio. Have you heard any of those songs? 
I haven't. And you know, it occurs to me, I need to look this up since you brought this up. Um, Broadway is airing a lot of things on TV right now since they've gone dark because of the pandemic. So maybe Spongebob oh, that, available. I don't know. That would be a dream. I mean, just from, and you know, you kind of get a sense of the story whenever you listen to, you know, the songs from a musical, you can kind of get it. But um, I remember when it first hit, I remember seeing like people online being like, that's not SpongeBob SquarePants. That's Person Bob normal pants because you know it's just it's people and they're not like in the like the Nickelodeon mascot costumes or anything because it's you know but but when you're listening to it, it doesn't. I mean, obviously it's not Tom Kenny's voice, but the person they have being SpongeBob really brings through that that character that positivity and the Patrick person brings through the dumb and and the Squidward. I mean, you can tell who they are even though you can't see them and it's not the normal voices. Because the things they are saying and, and, and the way they sound is still very true to the to the show. That's that's that they must have captured the characters really well. Yeah, and that, that can't be easy to I mean I I mean I think back to my own childhood of um you know the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles live tour where they were singing Ninja Turtles and oh that's not I'm so glad they did better by SpongeBob. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not everything translates. Not, it, yeah, I'm, I'm sure it helps if you can use some of the same people, or find people who are just such devout fans that, that they know they know those characters inside and out. If you if you're fortunate enough to find people like that, yeah, I think <laughs> I think that's one of the things about SpongeBob is you have. I think a lot of people now who are still working on it, you know who probably didn't grow up with it necessarily, but, you know, got into it when, you know, like they were in high school, college, or whatever. Now they're getting the opportunity to work on the show and they're bringing that reverence to the material that, you know, they don't want to be the one to, to screw it up. And they, they want to, they want to share that thing they loved about it and make more of that. And I think a lot of like the voice actors, you know, I, I have a, I think they have like a real attachment obviously to these characters too. I, you know, I know Tom Kenny um, has, a deep affection for SpongeBob um, and, and, and being a part of that, you know, creating that now, not just, he's not just guy coming in reading the lines off of a script and walking out, you know, he, cause he'll be, I, I've, I've gotten, I've had the privilege of meeting him at conventions, um, you know, and it really comes through that, you know, when he, meet, he meets a child fan of SpongeBob, you know, he's boom, you know, he's, he's representing that, that character cause he loves the character too and making sure that he doesn't interact with that, with anyone in a way that the, the character wouldn't. Yeah, that, I, that's one of those things that he's probably will always be carry SpongeBob inside of him. I, yeah, that's the thing when you have a long running show like that. I, I, I imagine that you know that's probably the thing he'll always be best known for at this point, despite being the mayor of Townville and Powerpuff Girls, which was critically underrated. <laughs> 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 well, shifting gears a little bit then. Uh, I would love to talk to you a little bit about your new album that just came out. Um, let's see, last week, right? Yeah. I think. So last it's week. called The Loud Album. The Loud Album, yes. I and usually more folky, but we got a little carried away with the production because I was like, ooh, and then how about a, a tambourine? Ooh, and then some hand claps. Ooh, and then an electric guitar here. Oh, yeah, it was just like a kid with a toy box, you know, just pulling out every toy and playing with it. So, uh, yeah, it got a little loud, but it was really just, I, I was just going with my instinct of what I thought each song needed next. I, I didn't have like this full vision of, you know, like a concept album of, you know, Sgt. Peppers or something. I just, just was like, let me just go with what feels right for each song. And it just came out louder than, than usual. <laughs> <laughs> it seemed to me to have, I, and maybe it's because I like Loud Album, I was expecting this, but it felt like it had a very high energy level in, in its production to me. I, when I'm listening to it, it, it just feels, um, you know, and I, I know uh, as an artist, you know, you're probably like, oh, they're all my babies and probably no favorite album, but I could understand this could be one of your favorites because it feels, I you could have easily I think called, called it the fun album. Oh, sweet. It feels fun fun when I'm listening to it and yeah, high energy and exciting and just like you're like happy to be doing it. I totally was. I was having so much fun. 
uh, especially with the, you know, when we got to do the icing on the cake, which is the singing, the singing, the final vocal, the lead vocals, you know, as opposed to, it's, a, it's mostly me doing all the background vocals too, the ooh, ah, all that stuff. That's, that's me, 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 and me, and more me. Um, can't get cheaper help than that. <laughs> <laughs> but do you pay? You should pay yourself. You know that's uh, yes. yeah. You know it, you heart, negotiate with yourself better. I guess I don't know. Agreed. I'm, I'm too cheap with myself. So uh, yeah, we we had a really good time making it, and I, I worked with Steve Goody, who just seems to. He's also a comedy musician, and he was at the board engineering. And then every now and then I'd pull him in to do something vocal, or he also played drums and bass, and some we split the guitar work. And he's so he's multi-talented. So it's really just mostly me and him, except for there's one track on there stuck at 13 that I recorded uh, that was left over from the previous album, Totally Average Woman. So it's stuck at 13 was recorded out in Los Angeles with Bob Malone. And um, it didn't didn't make the cut for that album because I didn't have the vocal ready. I hadn't really learned it. It's harder to harder to sing than I thought, and, and I hadn't. Usually, I learn a song really well, play it, test it in front of a bunch of audiences, and and um, and work out any like, oh, maybe this line should use that word instead of that line. It you know it just sort of smooths itself out through performance. But stuck at thirteen, I recorded it when it was I was still working on the lyrics when I recorded it. So uh, you, I, I like to smooth things out in front of a live audience, but now now that's impossible. It's just not the same to do a live stream where you don't hear anything. I have, I have this, <laughs> but I decide how much applause. I also have this if you want to like it a little bit. Oh. Or this could be the kids, you know. Or the together, story. yeah. Stereo, laughing. Keep layering it in Pro Tools. But yeah, it's, it's when I'm um. When I'm doing live streams, I do a, a free live stream every Friday just t to help everybody keep their spirits up through this whole craziness of being holed up in the house, except for the lunatics who are on the beach. Uh, that I, I, when I do the live stream, all I see is the chat, you know, and people will put little icons of clapping and all that. But when I play in front of people, I can feel if something isn't working. Not even if I don't hear it, I can just feel it. And that I can't, I, I, that's what, that's the one thing that's very, very different doing a live stream is that I, I, I don't have that just being in the same room, like, oh, that didn't work or, oh, they really got that one, you know, or, okay, I, I can feel they're not done laughing. So I'll just keep vamping, you know, and I, I can't, I, the, all that is different now, but there's pluses and minuses, you know, not having to get in the car and, and drive to Syracuse, you know, yeah. I can reach, and I can reach anybody, people who haven't seen me play in 15 or 20 years. You know, they heard me last heard me in Georgia in 1998 or someone who's in Alaska was like, when are you going to come to Alaska? Well, technically I'm in Alaska. I'm everywhere. And, and I did a thing um, with some people yesterday in the UK, a Facebook live with a group in, in the UK and boy, that's a real schlep <laughs> to get to the UK, but now it's just a click or, you know, a number of clicks with the open broadcasting software. But yeah, it's, um, it, there, there are definitely some pluses to it. Uh, you obviously don't really get to do it live right now, but of the songs you have worked out live, which ones kind of seem to be the, 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 uh, the showstoppers or your kind of your favorites to do in front of the crowd? I think the, if I was to pull, let's say three off this album that people are really digging, uh, surprise hit is You Are the Salt, uh, the the love song sort of about a one-sided relationship. <laughs> We're back to that theme. <laughs> like, <laughs> And that, that song would kind of describe those two. And uh, Things I Trust More Than You has been pretty popular. And I do enjoy I was, that one a lot. That thank one, you. I, and then Gluten-Free Diet has, has gone over pretty big, too, with um, some of the DJs who are playing it. You know, the my writing it came out of a conversation at a convention 
Uh, it was very late. It was one or two in the morning and we were just sitting around talking about being on a gluten-free diet and, and just making cracks about all the stuff we couldn't have anymore. And then I was like, oh, song. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Carla, thank you so much for coming on uh, the show. Um, I appreciate it so much. Uh, again, love the album. Where can people find the album? Oh, uh, well, my website has all the pointers to everything. So just go to CarlaU.com. There'll be links at the bottom of the, of the thing, too, for people to click on in, in, on YouTube. So. Yes. Yeah, so but uh, I, like, I listen to it on iTunes. Is it on Spotify? I don't do Spotify. No. I think it is. So, But <laughs> wherever you get your music, you should be able to hear the Loud album, which I, would, uh, I, I think is also the fun album. So. Sweet. I like it. Thank you. Thanks Thank you that. so much, Carla Elbrick, oh, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for watching Thing I Love. I'm the Marvelous Patrick. For links on all the stuff we've talked about, as well as our guests, please check out the show notes below. And also, for extended interviews and more bonus features, please check out patreon.com slash Marvelous Patrick. Thanks for watching. Hit the subscribe and like buttons, please. Bye.